Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. In this session we're going to study uh, chapter 12 uh, from verses 4 to 13 but I think it'll be good for us to read uh, from verse 1 the verses that we thought about in our last session. So turn with me to Hebrews 12 and follow as I read. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, this is a challenging passage which talks about discipline and about our struggle against sin we pray that as we look at this together that you would open our understanding by your holy spirit to see the truths in here that you want us to take on board as we seek to live for you we ask these things in jesus name amen so last time we were looking at those first few verses where we were thinking about the athlete throwing off the things that would hinder. And some of them, we said, may have been good things, but they would get in the way of the athlete running the race. Now, the metaphor changes slightly and we're now thinking about discipline. And what the writer is talking about is the struggle against sin and you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Alexander McLaren, a great Scottish preacher of years gone by, described this passage as a lighthouse. He said, it gives the kind of teaching that we don't notice much when the sun is shining, but when night comes and storms set in, it suddenly blazes with a light that is essential if we are to find our way. It may be that uh, right at this moment, your life's nice and easy, everything is going well, or it may be that you're facing some severe trials. Well, whatever it might be, let's see what we can learn about trials and about our struggles. I remember when I worked for Carpet Right, uh, there was one of our regional sales managers who later went on to become a divisional controller and um, uh, several times I had to spend time with him in difficult circumstances. And uh, the phrase that he kept using uh, when he was faced with any kind of challenge 
it wasn't negative it was it was its character building and he could see the benefit of the difficult times as he sought to develop his own character and that of other people so i want us to think about what is the purpose of our trials and i'm going to uh, flick over to our screenshot here and i've got some questions for you so this first one is what is the purpose of the trials that god brings to us now uh, just confine yourself to what's in this passage look at the text itself and see what you can glean as the the purpose of trials what does god use trials for in our lives secondly what should our attitude be to times of trial and hardship and then thirdly how should we prepare ourselves for trials um that that uh, uh doesn't imply that trials will come but the passage says they will so if we're not going through a period of trial what should we be doing to get ready for when the trials come so as i say focus on this passage these verses 4 to 13 and uh, hit pause the questions will remain on the screen and then when you've given these some thought and seen what the passage says come back and let's look at this together see you in a moment so welcome back what's the purpose of trials some of the things that i've found in here uh, are quite straightforward they're, they're in your face as soon as you look uh, the the um, indented if you if you're using the niv um, the indented paragraph uh, which is part of verse 5 and verse 6 is actually a quote from proverbs chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 and that makes clear do not make light of the lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. First thing to notice is it's for discipline. right? Discipline isn't about uh, us uh, going the wrong way. It's about teaching us to go the right way, to do the right thing. And then it also says, don't lose heart when he rebukes you. And that's when we have gone the wrong way and we're being corrected and pulled onto the right path. Some lovely verses in Psalm 119, um, verse 67. Let me just turn to it because I've put a marker here. Psalm 119, verse 67. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. The afflictions taught him. He learned from them. And then there's verse 71 where he says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. You may not feel it now. If you're going through some time of trial, you may not feel it now. But one day you will see that it was done for your good and maybe you can look back through your life and see times when God has disciplined you when he has rebuked you corrected you but now you can see the benefit of that but it didn't feel like that at the time did it second purpose of our trials so well probably the third I should say is this um verse 7 endure hardship as discipline we've seen that god is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father discipline is a mark of the relationship between a father and his child and i maybe when i uh, introduced it and said maybe you're not going through a time of trial now if that's the case, be wary, because uh, either trials will come, or if they don't, maybe that relationship is not what it ought to be, and God doesn't need to test you 
because actually you're not even walking in his way. But trials are a mark of our relationship. They're a sign that we belong to God and he is working out his best for us. Some more purposes of trials. Well, verse 10, it says God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. We're being disciplined, we're being given trials so that we can benefit from what God wants for us. We may have our own ideas of what holiness is. We may have our own ideas of what uh, we should be doing to follow God. But through our trials and our difficulties, God teaches us his way and it brings holiness. We share in his holiness. And then in verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, a harvest is something that we plant the seeds now and we nurture them, but we reap a harvest in due course. And what God is doing in our lives now will have a benefit but it may be some time before we say, see that as i uh, as i'm uh, recording this session the the smells of a beef casserole are wafting up the stairs to me it's been in the slow cooker all day this morning first thing i chop the onions i chop the garlic the parsnips the carrots uh, I put them all in the slow cooker with the beef and with some tin tomatoes. And it's only now that the smell is really um, beginning to come through. And not long after uh, I finish recording this, I'm hoping to go down and to enjoy it. But it took time. And that work that was done that maybe was painful to those vegetables and uh, and the meat that's in been in the the um, boiling water all day now it's producing what I want for it uh, and I'm going to enjoy it one of the American football coaches a man called Tom Landry said the job of a coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to be what they've always wanted to be I'll read that to you again the job of a coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to be what they've always wanted to be. That's what God is doing in our lives. I've spoken about Corrie ten Boom uh, lots of times before. Uh, she was somebody who uh, suffered in the concentration camps for the work that she and her family had done to rescue Jews from the, uh, the Nazis. And in her later years, Corrie ten Boom used to go round uh, talking, uh, using her experiences to talk about God's love and to witness for Christ. And she always used to carry with her a tapestry and she would hold it up the wrong way round. And all the audience could see when she was at a seminar or a conference was this ragged mess of threads and dangling loops and all of this, and it didn't make sense. And then she would turn it round, and the tapestry itself was of a beautiful crown. And uh, I didn't realise, I, I knew this poem, I didn't realise that Corrie ten Boom wrote it. Here's the words. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours, he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skilful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best 
to those who leave the choice to him. Isn't that uh, beautiful? God knows more than we do. And we may see the wrong side of the pattern. But what he's weaving in our lives is going to be a thing of beauty. A harvest that we're going to benefit from in due course. We just need to hang in there and learn the lessons God has for us. Question number two. What should be our attitude in times of trial and hardship? We've got the verse here that we endure hardship as discipline. And uh, earlier than that, uh, in verse five, it says, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. We need to take discipline and hardship for what it is. We're told in verse four, it's our struggle against sin. And through our trials and hardships, God is trying to root out the wrong things that are in our lives. He wasn't focusing on the persecution of the, the Romans might have brought to the Hebrew Christians. He wasn't focusing on what the fellow Jews might have said to them about leaving the Jewish faith and coming to Christ. No, he was talking to them about the trials that make them the people that God wants them to be. And so the first thing is, don't dismiss it lightly. Don't say, oh, it's nothing. It doesn't matter. Recognize it for what it is. Take it seriously and say, Lord, what are you teaching me through this? The second thing, again, in verse five, do not lose heart when he rebukes you. See, it's easy to become dismayed. The kind of things we hear from people is, why me? Why now? I could do without this. And those are all marks that we are, we're becoming dismayed. We're not understanding that God chooses the trial and he chooses the timing and it's all part of his perfect plan. So don't make light of it. Don't lose heart. And the third thing that I got from this is endure it. And that comes in verse seven. Endure hardship as discipline. Hang in there. Trust God and learn what he wants you to learn through it. So how should we prepare ourselves for trials? Well, it's interesting that this quote in verses five and six that I told you had come from uh, the book of Proverbs. It's introduced by the writer to the Hebrews saying, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? See, this verse is an encouraging verse from the Old Testament. There are many more. Words of encouragement in trial, words of promise, words of hope. Um, you maybe some are coming to mind. They're certainly coming to my mind at the moment. I, what's the the verse? I know the thoughts that I have for you. Uh, uh, in in the book of Jeremiah, thoughts of good and not of evil. The first thing we need to do to prepare ourselves for trial is to get to know God's word and not forget it like these Christians seem to have done. The second thing is in verse 12, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. How do you strengthen them? You strengthen them through exercise. Not all trials are big trials. Not all temptations are big temptations. Sometimes we think that the small stuff doesn't matter, that we can just forget about that. Actually, exercise involves the small stuff. It involves being faithful, even in the small things, so that when the big things come, our muscles, our limbs, our spiritual uh, muscles are exercised. And then we're ready for the bigger tests. Doing nothing 
results in what the the medical uh, profession calls atrophy if you uh, ever get to the situation where you've uh, maybe um, been through a major operation and you uh, have had to lie in bed for a few weeks it then becomes difficult to rehabilitate your muscles to enable them to walk again because disuse leads to atrophy and if we're not constantly exercising our spiritual muscles in the small things when the big things come we won't be ready to make a stand so don't forget god's word exercise the third thing it says in verse 13 make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed what does that mean let me put it in today's language watch where you're going actually this is reflected in proverbs and chapter 4 and verses 26 to 27 it says give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways do not turn to the right or to the left keep your foot from evil that's what it means when it says watch uh, make level paths for your feet it means watch where you're going make sure you're walking in the way with the lord make sure you're uh, in step with him that you know that he's with you and you've not decided to go your own way and do your own thing you may know the name joe dimaggio uh, i've been reading a a book uh, and in fact let me I, I took a a picture of the cover uh, I may have mentioned this to you before uh, John D Gillespie following Jesus in an age of quitters and this is about the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards for today Jonathan Edwards uh, a great spiritual man of years gone by and he wrote during his lifetime 70 resolutions and this book goes through those uh, chapter by chapter. There are 70 chapters. And uh, the author, John Gillespie, just gives some background to it. His sixth resolution, I'm going through these a day at a time. Uh, he says, resolve to live with all my might for all of my life. And the writer says this. From 1936 to 1951, excluding the three years that he spent in the US military during World War II, Joe DiMaggio played more than 2,000 Major League Baseball games for the New York Yankees. During that time, his team won the World Series nine times. Known for his tenacious competitiveness and phenomenal skill, the Yankee Clipper summed up his heart with these words. I'm just a baseball player with one ambition, and that is to give it all I've got to help my ball club win. I've never played any other way. Late in his illustrious career, when his ageing body was wearing out and he could only play with great pain, Jolton Joe was asked why he still insisted on giving it his all, every game every play no matter what even if the effort would have no impact on the outcome of a particular game his reply because there's always some kid who may be seeing me for the first or last time i owe him my best can i say of my dedication to christ and his gospel i'm just a jesus follower with one ambition and that is to give it all I've got to help the cause of Christ win. I've never lived any other way. Can I say of my resolve to give my all for Christ every moment, regardless of pain and discomfort, there's always some lost soul who may be seeing Christ in me for the first or last time. I owe him my best. That's a great challenge for you and me as we face trials and difficulties. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word encourages us uh, by telling us that when trials and difficulties come, 
you have a purpose and through them you are seeking to uh, reap a harvest of fruitfulness in our lives. Lord, may we not shy away from trials and difficulties. May we not treat them lightly. May we not pretend that they they don't matter. May we uh, stand firm and endure to the end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I'm recording this, we're just a couple of weeks away uh, from Lent. Uh, and when this uh, drops, Lent will be just over a week away. This goes out on a Tuesday morning and Ash Wednesday, the start of Lent, will be one week and one day ahead from the launch of this particular session. And um, you may have something already sorted out for Lent, but I'd like to recommend a book to you. And it fits in with the theme of what we've looked at today. It's called Finding Mercy on the Way of Sorrow. And it's an Easter devotional with a reading for every day of Lent based on the book of Lamentations. That's not a book that uh, I've studied. And uh, there are some famous quotes in Lamentations, but I really couldn't tell you what the structure of the book is about. But I'm looking forward to going through this. And if you haven't got something sorted for Lent, can I recommend this to you? Uh, it's published by tenofthose.com and uh, I've put both of the books that I've recommended in this session. Are for, you can get them from tenofthose.com if ever you want any Christian books. That's where I would always look first. Um, a Christian organisation that not only will sell books to you, but our, they, their very existence is to try and get as many good Christian books and tracts and leaflets into people's hands as possible. Um, so uh, just a thought for you as Lent approaches. Well, I'll look forward to being with you next time when we'll uh, continue our journey through the book of Hebrews. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. But in the meantime, have a great week.